What's that? Scissors. Scissors? What about it? No, I don't. Sorry. Okay, students. Uh, here we go. Let's get let's get rolling. We have an exam on Wednesday. It's our first exam, and because the, of the fact that we have basically one week that is missing, it's going to be a little bit simpler than it might otherwise be. Now, there's still going to be it's still going to be challenging, but the the information set is going to be a little bit smaller. Uh, so. Uh, fewer things to think about, but you have to think about, you still have to think about them very carefully, as always. And uh, my, my normal uh, instruction for students taking my exams, and you, you know, those of you that had me previous semester, you know what it's like. You got to read carefully, really carefully, and think. And then, you know, so if you've done the normal amount of studying, and homeworking, et cetera, you might not get an A, but you're not gonna be flailing too bad, right? Uh, no, you're not gonna be like here up flailing like this, okay? You're gonna be, you're gonna be, you're just gonna go matriculate right through the material. Uh, and, uh, but we're going to have a little mini review in clicking, mm, 15, 20 minutes. Just to kind of get your brains warmed up, and then I'll turn you loose on the exam. Brandon. Will there be a question about the frozen chicken sliding across the table again? Frozen chickens. Frozen chicken sliding across a tabletop is physics 2053, although I could make it a quantum mechanical chicken <laughs> by the end of the So, I mean, maybe a little later in the semester we can, yeah. Another question. <laughs> All right, here's our outline for today. We're going to look at potential again. Uh, oh, sorry. Wait a minute. You got to tell me your name. Gabrielle, right? Maria. Close. <laughs> Who's Gabrielle over there? Okay, good. See, I, I'm thinking in the right geometry, but I got to get a little more precision. Good. How many questions? What does the syllabus say? I think it's 42 points, right? Right? Okay. So that would be 42 Scantron problems, but we're not going to have all Scantrons. So it's going to be a mixture. So it might be 36 Scantron and then like two or three problems using the eye clicker to type in your answer. And we're going to be doing some, get your clickers out. We're going to be doing some, ooh, let me. Um, we're going to t talk about uh, potential for all of today. And we're actually going to be dipping into 19.4, as I said, toward the end of the lecture today. And we'll do a little bit of document uh, cam work at the at the begin at the toward the end of class. All right. Uh, so let's get down to it. Uh, last time, uh, we don't talk on top of me. Okay. Um, uh, we talked about the point charge potential, and I had a, a typo in there. I had a minus sign. I changed it to a plus. If you looked at the uh, YouTube, you'll know that. Um, it's an abstraction from the electric field and so forth. KQ over R is the general form for it. And that adapts to a positive or a negative charge Q. So either way, it's good. Uh, here's a little bit better diagram. Um, and this is for generic charge Q, neither positive nor negative uh, signified. Um, but the function, if Q is positive, the function itself, everything else in there is positive. Because the radial distance, distance is always a positive. 
All right, and Q, K is uh, Coulomb's constant. That's a positive, 9 times 10 to the 9. Is it still on the board? Yeah, it's still on the board up here in red. Um, now, the textbook mentions that this function is like an electrical hill. However, uh, that is only for uh, the situation uh, in which you have a uh, positive charge. So V of R uh, is going to be a positive function if Q is positive. All right, so V of R1, small denominator, big quotient. R1 is smaller than R2. All right, so R2 is the big denominator, but that makes a fraction, a quotient, smaller overall. All right, so you got V of R1 greater than V of R2. And so for a positive apparatus, a positive test charge, there's your downhill slope. You know, your, your uphill is closer to Q. Your downhill is further away. Now, the opposite of that uh, is the electron. The electron will kind of roll uphill. You know, if you, if you put a a little electron near this charge, if it's positive, then it'll be attracted. So it'll want to go up to higher uh, levels of voltage. Now let me point out to you, can you punt this down a little bit? Uh, let me uh, point out to you, all right, that's good, that the voltage is unique. It's uniquely determined by by design, well, it doesn't have any ambiguity. You still have to, you know, you construct it from whatever your source array is, one point charge or a dozen or 10 of the 23, you know, depending on your, your, you know, your source charge. If you're looking at crystals, you're working in groups of, you know, 10 or 12 and, uh, and multiples thereof, on up to 10 of the 23. Uh, but a point charge is fairly simple. But there, it's always uniquely determined. And the reason that that is handy for us is so that we can do a lot of our calculations without having to worry about positive and minus apparatus charges, test charges, or anything else. And we get all the voltages done. We get all the electric field vectors figured out. And then we say, all right, what's F equals MA? And then we predict where, you know, the particle, your apparatus is going to move, you know, from point A to point whatever, all right, uh, and what the energy is going to be and stuff. Uh, now, for uh, more complex configurations, you still use this. You, s you have a sum, and it's a scalar function, so you don't have to worry about vectorness in this. Now, the electric field, you can make a sum of electric field vectors, and we're going to actually do that mentally today. Uh, but th there's still a lot of trig involved in that formula. R, if you have more than one point charge, you know, it's, it's a little bit tricky to figure out the R for relative to one of your source charges, and then the R relative to the other source charge. And if you have more than, if you have 10 of the 23, forget about it. And the way to figure out things with 10 of the 23 source charges uh, is to use calculus and trig at the wazoo. And we're actually going to do some verbal, uh, some visual calculus today. I'll kind of guide you through it. Uh, but before we do that, I want to show you a little bit more about the potential energy function and the potential function. They're different. Remember that. Point charge potential is not the same as point charge potential energy. You have to make those distinct in your mind. Now here's EPE for a proton-proton system. All right, and the location of one of the protons is that R is equal to zero, and then the other one's at R equals three or 2.25 or wherever you are on that chart. And you can see that this function, EPE, goes uphill um, to the left the closer you get to the, the first proton at R equals zero. Matter of fact, it goes to infinity there, which is one, one of the ways that you can um, say that um, you can never actually get to the center of a proton. 
for instance. Okay, you can you can get close, but you can't touch infinity. Now here's a, an electrical potential energy uh, curve for an electron proton system. All right. Now here's the thing about this. Um, this one downhill, the slope is downhill to the left. And this one, it doesn't really tell you, or I haven't really told you, if the proton is at r equals zero or the electron is. Either way, you know, this, this is relative to one of them. Okay, so if your electron's at r equals zero, then this is the, uh, the hill that a proton will want to fall down. It will fall inward towards that electron. All right? If it was a proton at r equals zero, the electron would want to fall down to the negative, the lower values of potential energy. That's what nature always does. Right? That's the direction of the force. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of it. You know what you do here is you look at the s slope. The slope of these graphs, this one... Uh, and this one, uh, the slopes are uh, equal to, uh, you know, delta y over delta x, or rise over run type slope. That's the, uh, in this case, the electric force. These are potential energies. So the slope of, on this chart is the uh, electrostatic force. It's away, it's radially outward for a proton-proton system. For electron-proton system, uh, like this, it's radially inward, all right? And so the slope, so out here, let me get my cursor over here. Out here, like at R equals 2.5 or so, the slope is pretty pokey. You know, you're getting a little bit of inward Newtons towards the center, but you're not, you know, but down here, whoa, you start to really get some Newtons down here because it's steeper. The tangent line here is steeper. And down here, the closer and closer you get to r equals zero, whoa, Nelly, you're just about falling off the cliff. All right, so you're really getting a lot of, a lot of rise over run. A lot of, a lot of dip, it's not a rise, it's a dip. You're getting a lot of dip for every centimeter or every nanometer that you go to the left. And the further left you go, the more you get. So that's the way this, and this is KQ over uh, K times Q1 times Q2 over R. It's the inverse R curve. Now, the unique function is, for a proton system, uh, is the electrostatic potential V of R. The customary symbol for that, not always, but f many places, is uh, V, capital V for voltage uh, after... Professor Volta in Italy that figured out a lot of this stuff. He figured out, he actually figured out how to make batteries out of parallel plates of two different kinds of metal with a little bit of salt water in between them, or brine, I think, with paper. And you know who figured, who really figured it out was uh, Galvani, the, the scientist Galvani, who apparently, the, st the legend that I have heard, and I will communicate to you, the legend, the myth of Professor Galvani of Italy. He loved frog's legs, which over in, Eng uh, over in Europe they eat. And I cannot fathom that, but that's apparently, they, they like to do that. So he had some from the butcher store, and he had them hanging out on his balcony. on copper. He had some copper hooks. And the balcony uh, was uh, made of cast iron and so when they came in contact you know the wind was blowing before you know just before supper he's getting his frying pan he's getting his Crisco in there or coconut oil or whatever they were using olive oil in Italy and he's going to fry up those frog you know a little bit of Kentucky fried seasoning in there Kentucky fried frog nice huh I just saw a student go Whoa, like this you know like she was about to puke anyway 
So they started. They started bang. The copper started banging against the uh, the cast iron, right? A little bit of a little bit of current, and it hit the nerves in the frog leg, and the frog leg twitched. And you know, if you ever, did you ever notice that? Like when you when you hit your your funny bone over here, and it's like an electrical shock. You know, it's like, whoo, you know, that's how your nerves work. And that's how the word, that's how Galvani figured it out. Two different kinds of metals. And then Volta figured, uh, you know, and then it started, you know, everybody started getting with the, with the action. So this is the shape of the hill that a proton would roll down. And when you have a potential function like this, V of R equals whatever it happens to be, you know, something nice and simple like a point charge or parallel plates or anything else, um, it tells you where the proton would go. But the thing is, protons are not usually the things, unless you're in the surface of the sun, you know, the plasma, the surface of the sun with a lot of protons and electrons flying around, a helium nuclei, all kinds of ionized atoms. Otherwise, it's the electrons, so you have to think to yourself, all right, this is what a proton would do. It would roll down this one, and an electron would do the opposite, so an electron would roll up the hill. So you have to think, you know, it's kind of like reverse psychology for what actually happens. The electrons are usually the things that, that happen. Now, uh, let me pause for questions before we continue. We're going to do some calculations in a second, but questions first. Emma, how are you feeling? It's rough. Yes, Daniel. This would be a graph of a proton's energy rolling down. No, this is the graph of a proton's electrostatic potential. So you have to say, all right, this is the, you. You have to abstract absolutely everything else out of the picture to write this, to, to figure this out. You have a source charge or a source charge array, in this case just a single proton. You figure out the potential and you curve it. And then you say to yourself, all right, eventually I'm going to want to figure out what other things do near this proton. So the first thing you do is you think about what a proton does. And then if, you, if, you're, actual, if you're interested in actual things, that actually move, you then you then say, all right, whatever the protons do and the electron is going to do, is going to experience the same force. Now, the thing the thing that makes it tricky again on top of that is, the proton is much smaller. So if this thing gives a little bit of a nudge to a proton, it's going to really get the, an electron going because it's about two thousand times the the mass for a proton compared to an electron. So. But, all right, let's uh, talk about units of measurement. Now, hopefully this is boring, but I want to go through it, make sure you got it all straight, squared away. And we're actually going to do a calculation. Make sure you have your calculator out. And remember, on the exam, no cell phone calculators. You have to have, here's the one I use. This is a TI-30. This is, you know, this is amazing. I, I think the only thing that, Texas Instrument makes our TI 30Xs because this is a TI 30X 2S. So this has got about 70 symbols here, uh, but it's a solar power calculator and it's scientific. And you've got to know how to use scientific notation absolutely on your calculator. Let me see that one. Dude, this is the same kind. Where'd you get it? Bookstore? Uh, my brother handed it. Yes. Yeah. Get this is like fifteen bucks at Walmart. If you have a programmable calculator, uh, I don't want you to use that. Use something like this. All right, but not a cell phone calculator. And if worse comes to worse, you can do it on paper. The old sixth grade long division methods. With scientific notation. Nice. All right, so force. Metric units. 
This is old news. Newtons, energy, joules. Um, now, the electric field, remember, we, it's actually, it's, it's got the energy of electric force divided by a charge, so it's Newtons per coulomb. And it doesn't have a fancy name. You know, force has the fancy name Newtons. Energy has the fancy name Joules, after James Prescott Joule. Uh, there should be one for the field, but there isn't. But there is one for potential, the volt. And one volt is equal to 1.00 uh, Newton meter per coulomb, which is the same as 1.00 Joule per coulomb. All right. So energy per coulomb, force per coulomb. Those are the D and C on this list. All right. And you can read about that in the, in the textbook. Chapter 19, I think, goes into that. Uh, now, there's a fundamental unit of energy involving the electron. And as you know, uh, my animation is not quite right here. Um, if you think about it there, Potential is coulombs or is joules per coulomb. So if you multiply a volt times any charge, it'll give you a unit of joules, right? Because a volt is a joule per coulomb. So if you multiply five volts by two coulombs, that's 10 joules, 10 joules of energy, all right? So when you zap um, two coulombs of charge, out of a battery, a five volt battery, you're producing 10 joules of, of work on those electrons, all right? So any kind of charge times some voltage and bingo, you've got energy, unit wise. Now the, the one that we use uh, is the electron volt, uh, abbreviated E, and you know that should be a capital V there for electron volt. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll try to change that before we uh, put it on YouTube. But uh, yeah, the electron volts, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joule. It's basically one volt, so one joule per coulomb, times the charge of the proton, E, which is up here, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. So the coulomb in the charge, E, cancels the per coulomb in the potential in the volt and you're left with joules and that's how many joules you got in one electron volt and this unit is handy for molecular systems you know nuclear atomic systems uh, for instance the ground state of the hydrogen atom is uh negative it's it's uh it's a proton-electron system, so it's negatory, and it's actually negative 13.6 uh, electron volts. And the zero point of the potential energy function for the hydrogen atom is at infinity. Uh, go ahead and make a note of that. That's true for any of those point charge potentials as well. When R goes to infinity, the quotient goes to zero. You get bigger and bigger denominator, yeah, the infinite limit. And uh, so here's the, this was supposed to be a little bit earlier in the slide. So change in electrical potential energy is basically whatever your charge is. The charge of your apparatus times whatever your source charge uh, delta V is. And that's delta capital V. You know, so how far down the hill you go times your charge. All right. And so if you change, so, so a proton, if, you ha if you're going downhill, you know, like uh, the curves that we were just looking at, for the KQ over R, it was going downhill to the right, okay? So if you put a positive proton in there, the proton would go downhill to the right, delta V would be negative, and uh, so... Potential energy, delta EPE, would be negative, And that means it's losing potential and gaining kinetic. In other words, it's getting faster. It's fleeing the, the, uh, the source charge. Now, I want you to get out a piece of paper and work with your group. 
uh, turn on your clicker. Uh, we're going to have a numeric input answer with scientific notation. All right. And it's about converting, it's about joules and stuff. So this is an energy question. Here you go. At what distance D are a proton and an electron at a relative energy level of negative 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules? All right, go ahead and calculate that. From what you know. And I'll give you a few minutes to calculate that. So you're going to need K up here, and you're going to need E. And on the exam, you'll have both of those on the cover page, so don't worry about memorizing them. I saw you in lab this morning. Oh yeah, I was covering for someone who's at the um, DPS, the Planetary Society thing in uh, Geneva. Geneva, Switzerland? Mm -hmm. That's where the conference is this year. Dude, nice. Mm -hmm. so she's there, See, so you should be over there. I was at the one last year in Tennessee. But this year our group only had money to send one of us. So who went? Jenny? I, no. Um, do you know Anisia? No. She's got to go. Yeah. Nice. But she's the first author on the paper. Uh, paper right now, so. Yeah, I did that a few times. You know, I, I, I was at this one, my first time ever giving a paper at a conference, a black holes conference. Uh, I, I, it was at University of Oregon. In, it was, I think it was in Corvallis. I don't know if that's Oregon State or University of. Anyways, it was near a friend of mine who's an electrical engineer. So I said, why don't you come down and look at my, listen to my talk, which he did. And so we, you know, my talk was in the first afternoon session right after lunch. And so my, my buddy George, he came to the session. I gave my talk. And it's really difficult. And, you know, black holes... Uh, process and uh, you know George he's, he's sitting in the front row and afterwards you know after the session we left and we went out and got something to eat I think I'm not sure but he said you know and, and but it, it my talk it was terrible it went terrible oh, really? yeah because nobody asked a single question and uh, not one mm -hmm. and my, my advisor was there he could have asked some questions but not anybody from the from the audience, mm -hmm. you know. And all the all the astrophysics eggs eggheads in the in this you know like a hundred or something people in the room. It's a big lecture hall. And so, uh, so my buddy George said, I think everybody was asleep, you know. But it was also a very difficult yeah. subject. And, uh, and so I asked my advisor about. It. He says, Yeah, that's. That happens a lot when you're the first person uh, to give your talk right after lunch. Everybody's kind of <laughs> ready for a nap. <laughs> yeah, so I got another time. I was at this really big meeting in Washington D.C. and in astrophysics, they have 
it was American Physical Society open meeting, so anybody that's a member can present a paper. And unfortunately, anybody can join American Physical Society. And so there was, um, on my, on my, my, my session, there were like four different talks, and I was one of them, and I was looking, so, you know, the schedule, question? I'm sorry, I had a question for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to see if we're on the right track, because the way I was thinking about it was, you know, we're solving for all, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, I put everything on the other side. This relative energy... This is no good. This is uh, voltage. You want... Oh, that's volt. Oh, okay, I'm using yeah, the wrong. Yeah, you want potential yeah. energy up here. So, there should be two charges up there. Proton and electron. Oh, that Q1, Q2. Right, one. you're doing Q1, Q2 on this. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. And then R in the denominator, then solve for R, yeah. yeah. So anyways, the four or five people giving talks in my session, you know, the eight-minute specials, you know. And, uh, and so, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't, wasn't no, there was two-minute question period. So, so it's at this big hotel in Washington, D.C. and everything. And anyways, a month beforehand, they... They came out with the program, and I'm looking through it, and I, I was looking at the other topics in my session, and, you know, like one guy was talking about some kind of planetary resonance, and another guy had something about how Einstein was completely wrong, and I, I said to my boss, I, you know, this is a a month or so, a couple of weeks before the conference, I went to my, 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 my advisor and I, I said, I'm doomed. I'm in this, these guys are, mostly, several of these guys are crackpots. And he said, yeah, I know, that's the crackpot session. I've been in it many times because relativity attracts crackpots like honey attracts flies. And in a situation like that, where anybody can publish an abstract and then a paper, you know. So he said, just it, just give your, you're just going to give your talk, and then that, that'll be it. And, you know, there will be people there that are normal. And I told, but I told, I thought to myself, oh, man, the crackpot session. But, you know, it's just, it's always something, you know. It's, Those are kind of fun to watch, though. Oh, the eight-minute specials? No, the crackpots. Oh, crack yeah. yeah, well, this one guy had... It, the, the reason I remembered it is because this one guy had a talk, and he was talking about the orbits of the uh, moons of Jupiter, I think, something like that, or the, 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 the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, something, and how there's some kind of resonance, which there are, you know, the asteroid belt's got, you know... And, but he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about how they affect plants, green plants on Earth. And I, I didn't realize it at the time. It just looked like a moon. You know what else I, I found out? This was one of the instructors, an adjunct at our school, who would come in... At, at, Every few sem once every few semesters and teach class if they had an overload classes. And he, yeah, come on up. Oh, when she could bring her stuff. Right. What is your name again? Nadia. Nadia. Okay. Okay. So I have questions. Are we using this equation? Is nope, you're using Q, Q1, Q2. Because remember, this is energy. So you have to have two charges. Okay. And, when are so, we and what are the two charges in this one? Well, that number, one positive and one negative. Right. Okay. And what are, when are we using this equation? What are you talking about voltages? And we're going to talk about voltages in the next problem. Okay. All right. Yeah, so you should have, you could, you could use, the, the EPE is, is very similar to this. It's KQ1, K2, Q2 over R. Okay. Thank you. So this, 
so this uh, this instructor, I was grading exams with him one day, and I was, I, I asked him, you know, uh, what is your research area? Because it's the first time I'd graded had him for exams, and. Uh, he said, well, I, I do uh, planetary research. I said, oh, yeah, really? What, what, what exactly do you do? You know, planetary science, physics and stuff? Yeah, question. Because it's a positive, I just write it like that with an 8. Not like, not any... Um, you have a positive? Yeah. Something times 10 to the positive something? Yeah. Uh, just write a positive number there. Yeah, so this one, I, I gave you an example with a negative 10 to the minus 7, but if you have a positive, you know, if you had 10 to the positive 7, just write EE7. Also, right? in this case, EE8, no, no plus yeah. sign. No. Okay, thank you. Right. So, so, so I asked him, well, wh what kind of planetary research do you do? He said, well, I, uh, I don't tell anybody, but I actually calculate uh, horoscopes. And it turns out that he belonged to this cult that, is a, that was an end-of-the-world type cult. At least at the time, they thought that the end of the world was going to happen like later that year. And they had this big colony. This is out in Montana. And they had a colony uh, over on the other side of the Bozeman Pass in Livingston, Montana. And up towards Yellowstone, up they, they, they bought a big ranch, and they just had all their people there and made it into a colony. And he made a living making horoscopes for all those people. And I, I was so embarrassed that I, and I, I told one of, my, one of my instructors, this is in grad school, right? And I told one of my instructors, he said, yeah, I know, it's, it's amazing. But that's what he did, he just calculated you know, the orbits of Jupiter and moon, the moon and all this stuff. And did, I don't know how they do it with, with horoscopes, but apparently that's something that they do. And, and that's what he was doing. And, and PhD in physics. Was he just scamming them, like, just to make money? Or did no, he, he, was, he was part of the cult. He was in Montana because he was part of the cult. He, I think he originally was, I think they were all originally from California. You know, then they came up to the mountains to hide out and get ready for the end and all and you know the the day that the day that they said that the world was going to end, oh my goodness! It was like it really was like the end of the world, you know, coming because, um, like a friend of mine, her her husband drove for UPS, and that was his regular route. To, over there in that town, he did you know all up and down the valley for mostly for that colony. And he said, it, you know, those two or three days before that, the end of the world day, he said it was the people were getting supplies. And it was just like a madhouse getting, yeah, all those people. He said it was just like, you know, getting ready for World War II or something. And, of course, nothing happened. And so, you know, so then, well, there was an explanation for that. And, yeah, question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I know you. I know you. Homework. I, I saw. I was. I think we had one homework. During Dorian, I don't know. I was in Miami, like while uh, the hurricane. Yeah. And I missed the Friday. And you I did. You Send me a message in the, in web courses. Yeah. I'll think about giving you an extension. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right. What? Look at this. Right here, but then we had to move the decimal point over, so it's going to be 20 to negative 8. Positive, right? So it should be negative 8 in here, right? It shouldn't be positive. Yeah, so what? Yeah, so I have a question for you. How come you're using only one charge here? KQ times. Should it be KQ and Q2? It's an energy, yes. Okay. 
so you've got a little more calculating to do. You better circulate. Make sure they're using two charges. Kendra? Are they getting tripped up on only using one charge instead of the KQ1, Q2 over R? Yeah. All right. Because I, I just corrected these guys, and I corrected these guys, and some other ones. Good. Uh, are there any other misconceptions going on? All right. All right. There's some students over here. Two minutes. Two minutes. And I see some correct answers, but I also see some incorrect answers. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero.
All right. Let's take a let's take a look at your answers now. Let's see who's got what what answer is the most frequent. Um, by the way, the answer is 1.06 times 10 to the minus 10. Raise your hand if you got that. All right. Oh. Hold on now. Hush now. Now, if you look at, I'll, I'll be looking at stuff like this on Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night. Now, look at some of those answers. 1.060 EE minus 10, that looks all right. 1.06, uh, neg and those are negative, you know, that's, that's minus 1. Distance is always positive, so you shouldn't have any minuses up there. Uh... Uh, one point oh, now look at this. Look at this guy over here. 1.06, forget about the minus sign. That's already minus one point. But uh, EE minus 7. Now what they did is they, round, they uh, blooped up their uh, scientific notation. This one's similar, except that's an equal sign, uh, not a minus 10. I don't, well, I would. Something like that, I would give it to them. Um, They'd still get a minus one off for the negative sign, but. Now, here's some 1.62 times 10 minus 43. I'm not sure how. Some of these, I'm not sure how they. There's a, see, now. 6.61 times 10 to the 8. That's like uh, 100,000 kilometers. That's a good fraction of the way to the moon. So that is not realistic. Uh, 8. That's. Well, I'm not going to make fun of it, but I mean it's it's not it's not correct. Here's some more equal signs. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, uh, you guys, I'm sorry to say it, but the the decimal point. It looks like a lot of you got the de found the decimal point, but the uh, minus sign is also. The the display on this is pretty obnoxious on these clickers. Sorry about that. Now another question. Um, and this one is related. Let me get my clicker over here. How many electron volts? And this one is going to be numeric. Just type a numeric answer. Three, six, something, something, something with maybe a decimal point in there. Joel, your hair is gone. That's the last recorded his historic footnote with you uh, up there the other day. You know, you know what that means. We can sell those pictures for a lot of money if you ever become famous. Yeah, did you? Yeah, now it's it's totally buzzed. That's normal. I one time had so much hair. My hair is really curly. You know, it's you can't tell it right now, but it was so long in grad school that when I took a shower, it was down between my shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. So 
or jewels, and then just take what going for a single. Yeah, one. just look at your notes. We had a jewel is uh, an electron volt is a, a certain number of joules mm -hmm. from a single electron. No, just any any electron volt is a certain number of joules. It's in your okay. notes. Should be. Yeah, so, destiny. Okay. So I had the right answer at first, but then I went ahead and did because I was using this division here. And I oh, dude, no, yeah, yeah, not, yeah, you want. Why, mm -hmm. Can you clarify, like, why would you stop there? Because the R squared is the, f that's the Coulomb force. Okay. Okay, so KQ1, Q2 over R squared is the force. Mm -hmm. KQ1, Q2 over R is the energy. Got it. So that's what right. I'm Yeah, so you just needed one power. Because yeah, I messed up. Oh, I got everything right. So that's why, yeah. It, and that's why I got the, um, the other answer I got was like 1.02 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay. Yeah, so okay. All right. All right. All right. Oh, careful, this is a positive number. So I don't want to see any minus signs in any of this. Good. Two minutes. This should take you about a second to calculate if you have your notes. Andrew, mm -hmm. you know, I looked up how to pronounce NGO in Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. They have a YouTube of it. It's, it's completely different from, are you like from, I just can't type e from a different <laughs> part of Vietnam or something? Like or your family? Saigon? You know, because like, you know, here in the States, you know, you know, like a southern accent versus a Boston accent, big difference, you know. Oh, you know, I'm going to show them this. One minute. I like that shirt pocket. I've never seen anything. It's very cool. Nice. I almost bought something from Etsy. You know, kind of a decoration, but. 30 seconds. What's up? So. I was trying to type in two E's, and for some reason it's looping me through like numbers only. Well, now it is, yeah. I don't want any, you don't need scientific notation for this answer. Oh, okay, so. You don't need scientific notation for this answer, so if you're trying to type in E-E, -E, <laughs> you're barking up the wrong tree. You're over the river and through the woods and barking up the wrong tree. Way over there. Other side of the county. Twenty seconds, starting now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Um, students, my my wonderful students. Oh man. Uh, the answer here is 
which most of you got. Um, so that's good. Now I want to show you on document camp. Here's your basic. Here's your. Here's your basic calculation for the first one. It, you want to use KQ1, Q2 over R for the energy, the electrostatic energy, and figure out R. So really what you got to do is, you know, so what I did was I just calculated KE squared here, and that works out to about 2.304 times 10 to the whatever. And, and so then... You know, then you got 2.18 times 10 of something over here. And so the ratio uh, R is going to be equal to 2.304 divided by 2.108 or 2.18. And so that's about 1.06. This is the easy way to do it. So jot that down and I'll embed this in the uh, podcast, in the, in the YouTube as well. Let's keep going. Can you switch over to uh, what you call it? I'm going to stand up for a while. All right. Now I want to talk about parallel plates. And this is, this is the beginning of our last topic for today and the last topic that will be on the exam. Um, if, this is a figure from Chapter 19.2. Um, if they're metal plates, then the whatever charges that are on there they'll distribute themselves uniformly or, or nearly uniformly. Sometimes if they're really big out towards the very edge, you might have a little bit of asymmetry. But um, for, for, uh, for most purposes, we consider it to be uniform. Um, and there's going to be opposite charges on opposite sides. You know, for this example, the example is two oppositely charged parallel metal plates. Okay, so one of them is positive and one of them is negative. Um, so the way that you do that is you connect a battery, uh, let the electrons load into the right side as shown, uh, and then you disconnect the battery. All right. Now if you do that, the electric field is going to be perpendicular to the plates. All right. And I'm going to show you how that works here in just a minute. Um, in this case... Uh, with the positive plate on the left uh, and the negative plate on the right, uh, the uh, positive test charge will flee to the to the right. It'll flee the left side. That's what the field lines tell you. They always tell you what a, a little teeny tiny speck of positive charge will do. It'll it'll rotate over to the right in this situation. There's a bunch of formulas over there that we're going to go over here in a minute. All right, but before we do that, I have some more clicker questions for you. All right, so hit the refresh key. All right, and we're going to do multiple choice and see if I can catch anybody napping. All right, now this is about parallel plates. And hopefully... You guys will do this correctly. You connect a you connect a battery to previously neutral metal plates as shown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Read carefully and decide. Don't vote for E. Geniuses. That simply signifies that I, I ran out of tempting ideas. This should be, I consider this to be a basic, basic question. 15 seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, three, four. Wait a minute. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, 
one, zero. I, the reason I, I goofed up, I was watching the people that voted for E change their votes. All right, so the answer to this, of course, is electrons leave the... Yeah, so... We're losing time. You guys have to restrain yourselves. I don't want you to feel like after each question, you can... I'm talking to everybody. We're losing too much time for you guys. When we finish a question, that is not a signal to start blabbing. I'm trying to be nice. I try to shush you, but I have to yell today. We're losing time. All right. Now, anytime you see a positive plate, you know that that means the electrons are missing. So that kind of gives you the tip off that D is the op option that's correct on that. Now, I got another question for you. Uh, by the way, 83% of you got that one correct. So that's good. All right. Next question. Now, this one's a little tougher. Multiple choice. Just considering the two source charges in the red area. Okay, see that little red rounded rectangle? Read carefully and make a decision. Fifteen seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, let's see how you guys. Well, let me show you the answers that you typed in. Uh, so some of you voted for leftward, some for rightward. Um, and the right answer is uh, rightward. Because look. You know, on that, that char if, if you put a positive test charge there at point P, it would flee the left and uh, it would uh, be attracted to the, to the right side. All right, so that's good. And uh, let me see how many of you voted. Uh, majority voted for the correct answer on that one. All right, now this one's a little tougher. I want you to think about this one carefully. Just think about the green, the elect, the negative charge in the green box up there. We don't have enough information to calculate the exact tilt angle, you know, 45 or 27 or whatever, but. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, anybody vote for Northeast? Good. Yeah, it's. The pot. Look, if you if you put the positive chest charge at point P, it's going to, and, and, and that other charge is the only one that you think of, it's going to try to accelerate up towards that charge. So that's northeast, roughly. 
All right, now consider this one down here below there in the orange area. Twenty seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. See, this is good because now you guys are. Let me see how you guys are, dude. Yeah, see, now look at this. Let me close the question. See now? Good. You guys are, you guys are, you guys are geniuses. Well, somebody goofed up over there, but. But yeah, roughly southeast. Again, toward that isolated source chart. That's part of the source. Your source is the parallel plates. You know, some negatives on the right and some positives on the left. And they're, they're evenly distributed. And there's a certain distance between them. There's a certain width of the plates and all that stuff. And, but if you just concentrate on that one, you have to feel line point, the field points in that direction. All right. Hit the refresh key because now I'm going to give you a bindle of options. And you're going to have to type in a letter. It's still multiple choice but it's more than five options. So this one's alphanumeric. Now consider both of them, orange and green, and only those two. Now hit the refresh key and, and get me an A, B, C, D, all the way up to J. There's no letter I. Because that's so hard to see, to differentiate from the, the number one. That's great. I see people going like this and that's great. It's great. Because they're interacting, they're teaching themselves. They're teaching each other, I should say. That's what we want to do in this, supposed to be doing in this class. Twenty seconds starting right now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Raise your hand if you voted for H. Geniuses. And hey, you guys, when I say that the parallel, the field between the parallel plates is uniform and straight to the right, this is why. Because any Go ahead and make a note about how I'm going to describe this verbally. Choose any field point. There's nothing special about that field point. It's not at the middle. It's just kind of somewhere over there to the right. It's You're going to have charges above it like the stuff in the green. You're going to have charges below it like the stuff in the orange. And you're going to have stuff 
right across from it like the stuff in the red. All of which contribute, you know, the, the green and the yellow, they're symmetric. So you can have the same tilt angle to the southeast from the orange as you have a tilt angle to the northeast from the green. All right, so that's going to give you some net rightward newton, newtons or net rightward electric field, newtons per coulomb. And no matter how far up you go, you know, within reason, I mean, you can't go off the, you know, within the plates, no matter how far you go up there, you're always going to be able to say, all right, if I go up, that's another green area, and I'll have the opposing orange area at the same distance below my field point. And then, of course, we're not even talking about the positives on the left, but you're going to have positives over there, and you do the same analysis, all right? So what's the, the contribution of the orange positive at field point P? It's northeast. What's the contribution of the green positive at point P? Southeast. Tilt angles are different from the, the, the negative electric, the electric fields from the negatives, but those two will balance out and give you some net rightward electric field. Brandon. That's your prediction? Well, see, the thing is, I wasn't going to do that. But now I'm going <laughs> to. But only on your test. Uh, Krishna. No, if you, if the orange area, within reason, I mean, because eventually you're going to run out of plate going upward. So you can only go so far downward to get matching green areas upward. But you can, and, and don't forget, this is highly simplified. Because there, there, you don't just have, most of the time, in a metal plate, uh, what is that, seven seven electrons and seven missing protons from the other side. You've got more like seven times 10 to the 23. But eventually you're going to run on a plate. And that's why at the, at the edges of the plate, it doesn't, it's not perfectly straight across. But once you're inside the plate, you know, a few centimeters or so, yeah. Okay. You know. Question. Uh, what's your name again? Ashley. Ashley. Are field points always positive? Are field points always? No, they're... They're always what the ch source array tells you they are. All right. So, it, like Brandon was saying, if I turn it, if I rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, then the field is going to be down. The net field is going to be downward, away from the positives toward the negatives. And those are the source charges. So, whatever the source charges tell you, that's where it's going to go. And so that's why you got to think. You know, you got to think about all right. Point P? Yeah. Well, point P is just a geometric point, so it's neither positive nor negative. Okay. It's, a, it's a location in space. Remember, for the electric field and for the potential, you're only thinking about field points. You're not thinking about, you know, at the moment. Later on, maybe, after you calculate everything, but when you're setting up your field, you're setting up your pot potential, you're just thinking about geometric positions and your source array. Okay, so for us, the source array is the plates. Everything else is moonshine, just a bunch of geometric points, until we got to get down to brass tacks and actually build something and send something in a direction that we want. But uh, for, for when we're talking about electric field, now there's no newtons in an electric field to cause an acceleration. There's no F equals MA in a, an electric field until you put an apparatus of charge in there. A charged apparatus of some kind. All right, and we're not doing that here. Not, when you're working with field, you have abstracted your apparatus out, and you're only looking at your source array. Right. Now, qu another question. 
So, you know, we were talking about porcupines and how the electric field of a po an isolated charge is like a, po a porcupine, either outward porcupine quills or inward porcupine quills. Now, here's, here's another look at this plate. And so this is maybe another way to look at it. I don't know if you could jot this down, but you can at least look at this and think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, one of the diagrams from the other day. Here it is. With the field, this is for a negative charge. The porcupine quills are pointing inwards. All right. So this is the porcupine without any, without any uh, damage. This is the, the non-hostile porcupine. All right. So the porcupine quills are pointing inward. All right. So the field, for, so for that one charge up there, the second negative down, by itself, those would be the field lines. Now, if you bring it down to this one, that charge right on the, that dotted line that, you know, just the, for, for comparison, that one, the porcupine quill is going inward. And, you, and, and now look, to, to see, let's go back to the previous one. All right, for this one, the field lines, this, is a, this was our first question. This was the green area's negative charge. The field lines were going northeast at point P, which they kind of are. All right? Then we, we already knew the field lines from that one and the positive on the other side are going uh, to the right. And then we did this one. This was the, the negative charge in the orange area. And we said, oh, yeah, uh, roughly southeast, you know, depending on, you know, the, the exact geometry, but roughly southeast. And then this one, here's another one down here. We didn't go this far down, uh, Krishna, but we could have gone this far down. This, you know, the next one down in this, di this idealized diagram. And remember, there's 10 to the 23 extra electrons over here, at least. Some of your problems, th the problems that I like in the textbook, are nice little brain burners, by the way, about how many extra electrons and how many missing protons and stuff like that. You know, based on atomic weight. And here's, you know, here's another one. So basically anything, anything down here in the orange area is going to give you some southeast Newtons per Coulombs. But then, Krishna, there's, there's going to be some above that are going to give you some northeast the same amount. So they're going to be uniform. Yeah, until you run out of space, space at the top. Yeah, I mean, so it, it doesn't it doesn't work eternally. But you know, but you know, for uh, you know, it says and because remember, you were talking ten to the twenty three electrons. So you you know, you're going to run through a lot of electrons before you run out of you know opposites down. You know, a lot of green electrons before you run out of orange electrons down the bottom. So now, um, so that's over here on the negative side. Now, you've got to do the same thing over here on the right. We didn't really do this, but you could. Take a look. You know, so there's the outward porcupine quills. All right. From that, you know, so that's the, that's the positive in the green area. Now, we didn't try to figure out anything about that one. But you could see that at point P, the field lines are roughly southeast. All right? Because it's a positive. Now, here's the one right across from point P. The field lines are straight to the right. And now here's the one in the orange. And now at point P, these field lines, they're, they're, up, they're up to the northeast. So again, we get a northeast and a southeast. And you'll always get symmetric pairs from the orange and the green until you run out of plate. Uh, and so they'll always bounce out to some rightward uh, newtons per coulomb. Right now, here's another one way down here. All right. So the net electric field is rightward for this array. And that's if the uniform charge, if the charge density or the distribution of surplus charge or missing charge is uniform, which in a conductor, it's going to be pretty uniform. And also, if the plates are fairly close. Now, here are the dimensions for the plates width W and uh, distance, separation distance D. 
So if D is much, much less than W, then Krishna, you'll have a lot of greens matching orange areas the closer the plates are. You know, so if, so if D is one millimeter and W is uh, five centimeters, you're good. You're going to have a lot of greens and oranges matching up. But if W and D are about, you know, if, if, if W is, is two centimeters and D is like 1.5 centimeters, it's not going to be very uniform. You know, it'll look, it'll look more like a dipole field toward the edges, you know, down to the bottom and up towards the top. So, um, so now let's think about this as a pair, a pair of parallel plates. Now we charge them up using a battery. You know, and let's say that the, the uh, tw it's a 12 volt battery. So you charge it up with a 12 volt battery. That means the high side, the positive side is 12 volts. The low side, the negative side is zero volts. And then you disconnect, you loaded them up. Uh, and then the lines of equal voltage, here they are, I've drawn in three. We've sliced up the interior of the parallel plates into four equal slabs. All right, three it's three-dimensional, so we're looking at it from the edge view, the side view. And so those will be equal increments of voltages from 12 to 9 to 6 to 3 and then down to 0. All right. So if you divide it up like that, then you have 12, 9, 6, 3, and 0. And halfway is 6. Now here's something that I will compare it to. And this is, this is not in the slide. But it is, uh, I'm, I'm going to verbally describe something that Brandon kind of asked about. What if I turn this 90 degrees clockwise? then I'll have a downward electric field. I'll have um, a positive charge will accelerate downwards. And, and now, if you, the, the lines of, if you think about forces and accelerations, you'll have straight down accelerations. If you think about kinetic energies and potential energies, you'll have horizontal lines, because everything's 90 degrees, tilted, you'll have horizontal lines of equal potential energy. Now, what is that like? Gravity. So this is like a sideways view of gravity at the surface of Earth, where we consider the strength of the gravitational field to be constant, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, that's the same thing as saying that E is uniform and rightward. It's uniform strength. Just like G is uniform pretty much everywhere from the top of Mount Everest down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. All right. And with gravitation, certain elevations, certain potential energies. You know, relative to sea level, for instance. Here, certain this sideways distances, certain potential relative to the low plate, the zero volt plate. All right. Now, here's another diagram from the textbook, 19.4. This is figure four. And Krishna, here's where you can see towards the top, you're going to start losing a little bit of Flatness. It's going to start breaking. You're not going to see how it kind of loops up to the top there. And the lines of e this one's 175 volts, 50 volts in the middle, 25 volts, and then zero volts. So, but towards the middle, it's really straight. The field is straight across. And the lines of equal potential are straight down. But then towards the edge, that's what you call edge effects. You know, you're, you don't have as much uh, up towards the top. You've run out of greens. You've got all kinds of oranges, but no greens uh, towards the top. So you lose the straight across stuff and the straight down stuff. But other than that, and th so that's why we, we make the provision if the plates are close enough. If the plates are close enough, 
you're going to squeeze all those lines down to really, really, really uniform straight across almost for the entire length. Now, here's a side view, perspective view. You could probably sketch this. And this is, again, this is parallel plates, positive on the left, negative on the right, point A and point B. And the change in position, delta S, is positive to the right, SB minus SA, S being a generic coordinate. And then, you know, there's some kind of delta V, and it's going to be the difference uh, between the, the uh, left plate minus the, excuse me, the right plate minus the left plate voltage. So that's going to be negatory. Okay, so it's like 0 minus 12 or 0 minus 100 in the, in the other slide. All right, so that's going to be negative. All right. So the voltage decreases as you go to the right. And this is a perspective view. Same as the other views that we had, you know, just a, a second ago. Now, I have another question for you. Um, keep your question. Uh, maybe hit refresh. Let's see if you can answer this one. Okay, you have options A through H. So again, you have to select a letter and then hit the send key. Read very carefully. All right. Why is delta V negative? And give me your best answer. Fifteen seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Get your answer in. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or H. So this is, this is kind of like a matching. In other words... How would you verbally describe the fact that delta V is negative in this diagram? All right, let me cut the question off. Uh, a lot of good answers. Uh, here's the correct answer. Raise your hand if you voted for B. Okay. Oh, well, wait a minute now. This is also correct. Raise your hand, Raise your hand if you voted for C. Well, wait a minute now. How about F? All three of them are correct. All right, now, if I were to ask you a question, if I were to ask everybody except for Brandon this question on the test, um, you could vote, and I sometimes do that. Well, we couldn't do it on this because it goes up to H, but it's possible for, to me, for me to write... Um, a through E, and more than one being correct, all right? And um, I can grade a Scantron either like B or C correct. You know, so if I didn't have E, F, or G, or H, and just gave you A, B, C, D uh, on this, some of you would have voted for B and B correct. Some of you voted for C and B correct. And you could be graded correct on the Scantron. We can do that, all right? So always give me your best decision on a Scantron. Now, in general, the formula for the electrical field, go ahead and write that last one down. It's the opposite of delta V divided by delta S. That's called a gradient or a slope. And remember when I was talking about slopes? Yeah. The slope of the uh, KQ over R curve, yeah. And the EPE curve. 
The EPE curve, the slope of that gives you a force. The KQ over R curve, the potential curve, gives you the field. Right? And that's what this is. Minus delta V over S. So if your slope is negatory, your force is going to be positive to the right. If your slope is negative, excuse me, if your slope is positive, if it's higher potential to the right, then your electric field is going to be leftward. Now, we don't have that here, but, you know, I could, all I got to do is turn this one around 180 degrees, and that's what you'd have, all right? So it's always minus, minus the gradient, minus the slope, delta V over delta S. Now, to do that um, with the most precision, you have to use calculus, but this is pretty good. You know, rise over run is pretty good for us. All right, now I have, we're going to dismiss in a few minutes, but I want to do a little bit of sketching with you on the document camp uh, to amplify one more thing. All right, so let me go over here, go ahead and switch to the document camp, and I'll, I will embed this into the YouTube later today, hopefully. All right, now... For parallel plates, I told you that the lines of equi potential are parallel to the plates and the electric field, there's the electric field, is perpendicular to those uh, equi potential lines. All right. Now, if you have an irregular shaped object, like part of the Van de Graaff generator, no problem. In close, this little section here looks like a flat section. I'll kind of blow it up a little bit. You know, at the same, let me, let me change that to a little bit better tilt. Okay. Okay, so here's the magnification of that. All right, the electric field will be pointing straight off of the surface there for that little patch, roughly to the northeast, and the lines of equal potential for that little patch will be parallel to the surface. Okay? Now, if you take this patch down here, all right, a little tiny increment of the Van de Graaff surface, um, it's going to look like this. Draw it over here. All right, the electric field lines are going to go in this direction, so not quite as far northeast. So this is like a, a tilt angle of about 10 degrees versus this one's almost 45 up here. And you're, but you're, for, for just a few centimeters or a few millimeters, you're going to have perpendicular equipotential surfaces as well. So if you take a little tiny patch, the field lines are always going to be for like a metal sphere. They're the field lines at near the sphere, near the surface. Now, once you get, you know, if, you're, if you get out here, you know, a field point out here, then you got a lot of stuff going on, right? Now, last thing I want to show you is a really irregular surface. So let's take um, Bumblebee Camaro. All right, so here's Bumblebee, kind of a... Now, if Bumblebee for protection, charged his surface with positives like this. You know, because he's made of metal, right? He's a robot. Um, then, yeah, the field lines would go straight out here, uh, almost the same here. But then right in here, they'd be tilted upward a little bit. Here, here, here. But over here, going out this way, all right, and the field and the uh, equi potential surfaces would be similar. They'd be perpendicular to each of those. So up here, it'd be pretty much straight up, definitely straight up, definitely straight up up here. So your, you know, your equi potential surface might look something like this, parallel to whatever the surface is. All right. So you now to to actually calculate that. 
if you're not from the Decepticon, if you're not from the Transformers planet, if you're not a robot with a brain with a computer brain, you have to do a lot of, a lot of calculus to figure this out, right? But you know, and there's what we call differential equations that handle that. It's basically equations involving the gradient and the sources of the charges and stuff. Uh, but it, but graphically, it would you know it work like this. So any surface, you're gonna know if you take little teeny patches. It's kind of like on a on a. Um, you know what? One of the students over at this table over here in the back, CJ, raise your hand. All the way up. CJ's table. One of the students there gave me a, a, a final exam problem. What is the curvature of the of a drag strip? Curvature is infinite if you think of it as a straightaway. But if you think of it as on the surface of the earth, it has the curvature of the earth in this, dire in this direction. So that's the same thing here. You know, small patches of the earth look flat. You know, and that's what, that's what, so this is like Orange County here, and this is like Daytona, uh, Volusia County up here. All right, slightly different parts of the earth, slightly different tilt toward the sun, but you can think of them just for a little bit of an area as, as being flat. Okay, last few comments. We've got 10 minutes left. I want to entertain questions from the floor for the good of the order concerning exam one. Yes. How many questions? Uh, it's been asked and answered. What was the answer I gave earlier? A total of 42 points, so maybe 30-something Scantron items and two or three clicker calculations. But I, but I haven't written, I won't write the test. Now that I've had this last class, now I'll write the test. Uh, Brandon. No, this is 19.4. This stuff. Yeah. So in as much detail as we went into today. So we did a lot of pictures and stuff. So the 19.4 stuff is going to be related to diagrams and so forth. Yeah. The question was, when will I have annotations done for chapter 19? Later today. And I've already got a bunch in. Oh, also, that reminds me, Maria and Gabby and everybody at that table back there. I, put, I identified a few problems that I like in chapter 19. I don't think I'll add to that. But I will add some more annotations, you know, just verbal. Okay. Question. Do we need to memorize? What's the answer to that? Do we need to memorize? No, we do not. Busted. Yeah, so what's the, what's the full answer to that? Why don't you have to memorize? What's the answer? No, not, th not that guy. You with the specs. They're not provided. They're not provided for free. Matching questions. So there's going to be a bunch of matching items at the beginning of the test. And you'll match a concept to an equation and then go on your way. And you'll have everything you need in that for formulas. In that <coughs> Hold on. I know you're antsy to get out of here. But I want to give you one more thing about formulas. The exception to that is... Sometimes I'll put a formula directly in a question. You know, I'll write it. As you know, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Therefore, you know, what's the change in kinetic? You know, uh, and I'll do it that way. And uh, but most of the time, all the things we need are going to be up in the matching, multiple choice. Another question.
All right, you're dismissed. I'll see you on Wednesday. Megan. Where's Megan? Uh.